I am a visionary, exploring a universe of data to sharpen our view of the most distant galaxies, and studying black holes to help prove Einstein's theory of gravitational waves. I am a healer, giving doctors the power to turn mountains of data into life-saving breakthroughs. Identifying diseases like leukemia from a simple drop of blood, even in our own homes, and finding new ways to bring cures to my and the disabled in their homes. I am a navigator, mapping our world one millimeter at a time, and making even the largest self-driving vehicles safer for the long haul. I am a creator, learning to paint from the masters and applying their styles to create original works of art. I am a teacher, analyzing half a million player moves every game to identify strengths and weaknesses. And a learner, discovering new strategies from complex games. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome founder and CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang. Welcome to GTC 2017. Before I start, I just got to say, all of everything you've seen so far and everything you're about to see were all created by NVIDIA's creative organization. We have, we have just an amazing team of creatives in our company. As you guys know, we work at the intersection of art, science, and engineering. And this intersection is what made all of this possible. I love the work that they do, the craftsmanship, the dedication, their absolute focus on excellence, their creativity, their willingness to take a risk, put themselves out there, and not only that, it was all done by themselves. And, and um, uh, even the voiceover. Voiceover is done by one of our young employees, Helen Broinger. And she, uh, her parents work at NVIDIA. And, and uh, you know, it, we, we raised her. And that was her voice. And so I was, uh, I'm so happy about that. <clears throat> Her parents are going to be really proud. I've got a lot I want to talk to you about today. We have uh, laws of physics, laws of computing. We have special guests. We have artificial intelligence. And so I've got a lot of stuff to cover, so let's get started. There are two dynamics that are happening in our industry at the same time. I'm going to talk about both of them. This is the first one. For the last 30 years, for the last 30 years, we have benefited from one of the most powerful technological revolutions that anybody's ever seen. The combination of two effects created what is known as Moore's Law. One, architectural innovation that makes microprocessors better and better, more and more performant through architectural techniques. The goal is to find instruction level parallelism. And it's magic. Just think about what they're trying to do. 
Basically, a program is a sequential list of instructions, and it's performed one at a time. But somehow, computer scientists have figured out ways to do them in parallel. Well, one of the ways that you do it is pipelining, to start the next instruction, to start the next step before the first step was complete, make the instructions wider, do all kinds of amazing things so that you could speculatively execute something in the event that maybe you didn't have to change course. All kinds of amazing technology was created. Cache has got a lot, lots bigger. And then, of course, software techniques on top of it, optimizing compilers, made it possible for us to advance microprocessor architecture performance year in and year out. And we deployed all those transistors to good use. Now, the transistors that we added, more and more and more transistors, wouldn't have been possible to use if it wasn't because of a second law, the law of Denard scaling. Denard scaling basically says that we can put more and more transistors into the reduce its voltage so long as we continue to make the transistor smaller, reducing its capacitance. And by doing so, the combination of these two factors, more and more transistors, running them faster and faster at a lower and lower voltage, allowed us to continue to advance performance within some constant energy envelope. In the course of the last 30 years, we've improved processor, microprocessor performance by nearly a million times. By nearly a million times. Nothing in society has improved by a million times. And everything in society has been made possible because of this fundamental advance. Then in the last several years, it started to slow. Our abilities to harvest parallelism out of instructions, sequential instructions, started to diminish. And the number of transistors that we had to add in order to squeeze out that little tiny bit of extra performance was simply too costly. On the other hand, we were reducing voltage, shrinking transistors, and we're now up against the laws of semiconductor physics. There's only so far that we can push before Denard scaling started to fail on us. We now have found ourselves at the end of two, end of two roads. And it's it being incredibly well documented. We started talking about it, in fact, for many of you who have been coming to GTC all these years, I think I spoke about it at the first GTC. Uh, I speak about it at every GTC. And it's the, reason, it's the reason of our existence, recognizing that we need to find a path forward life after Moore's Law. John Hennessy recently talked about it. He called it the end of the road for general purpose processors and the future of computing. Mark Horowitz, also a professor at Stanford, spent enormous amounts of time with his colleague, basically plotted out every single major event and processor product and node in the last 30 to 40 years. And the results are actually quite amazing. The blue line basically shows the Denard scaling compounded with the lack of productive architectural innovations has led to the plateauing of processor performance. What used to grow at 50% per year, 50% per year compounded improvement is now improving at 10% per year. Yet, we can manufacture the transistors. The transistors are abundant. And in fact, if you look at it, look at that white line, that shows you how much transistors we have. And that was the ultimate observation, the ultimate observation of the beginning of our company. That observation was the reason why accelerated computing works. And it is the reason why we introduced the concept of GPU computing. GPU computing does several things. The first thing it does is recognizing the microprocessor is incredibly good at sequential instructions. It's incredibly good at single-threaded operation. That the craftsmanship and the innovation and all the engineering has gone into it over the course of the last 30, 40 years wasn't going to be replaced. And we respect the other law of computing, Amdahl's law, that if we were to accelerate the things that we could do, the part that we can't accelerate eventually becomes the problem. And so we have to make sure, we have to make sure that we honor that law as we change the architecture of computing. We did several things. 
the first thing that we did was we realized there's some workload inside some very important applications, some very important applications. Frankly, the important, these applications are the ones that the reasons why you are here. They're, they're, they're the algorithms of artists, of scientists, of engineers, of the explorers, the discoverers, the inventors, the da the, the Vinci's of our time, the Einstein's of our time. Their software includes some parallel computing aspects, some parallel processing aspects, that if we could figure out a way to offload of the microprocessor that was good at sequential processing, we could provide incredible speed up. So the first thing is to create a specialized, domain-specific accelerator that is a companion to the CPU, accelerated computing. The second thing we did was create an architecture that had a platform that we were willing to dedicate ourselves to everything we did for the rest of our lives. We created an architecture we call CUDA. And it's named after an architecture that we created in the very beginning of our company 25 years ago called UDA, Universal Driver Architecture. That architecture was extended for computing, unified driver architecture, excuse me. That architecture was extended for computing starting 10 years ago. We call it CUDA. This architecture is our computing architecture. And a computing architecture that you dedicate your lives to and you continue to promote, that you continue to sustain, you continue to improve, and it continues to add value, eventually, eventually, other people can benefit from it. It has to be special. It has to do something that general purpose computing, that commodity computing, or available otherwise generally available computing cannot do. It has to be special. It has to be something you dedicate yourself into. It has to be something that is available everywhere. It can't just be available on a PC. It has to be available on a laptop. It has to be available in the cloud. It has to be available in embedded devices. It has to be available everywhere. It has to be thought about from top to bottom in the sense that you have to have tools. You have to have middleware because computer architects and computer scientists need all of that to be productive. What's really special about GPU accelerated computing was that it took enormous amounts of effort to port, to refactor for all of you the applications you've developed on top of microprocessors onto this new computing platform. It took time. And it took specialized skills. And so we dedicated ourselves to having a team of computational mathematicians that can think across the entire stack so we work with you, work with the application makers, the algorithm developers, to find that match between the work that you want to do and the architecture we created. We worked at the architecture level, at the system level, at the system software level, at the algorithm level, and then we worked at the application level. The reason for that is because if you want to overcome the limitations of Denard scaling, you're going to have to do something pretty clever, and you have to think across every single possible layer of computing to find efficiencies, to get rid of waste, to do special and smart things. This way of doing computing, top to bottom, then bottom to top, top to bottom, then bottom to top, dedicated to one single architecture over the course of the last 10 years, the results have been phenomenal. If you look at the green line, that's basically the line that NVIDIA is tracking. Some people have described our progress as Moore's Law squared. And the reason for that is because, first of all, you get a big speed up. You get a big speed up over the natural microprocessor performance. Secondarily, it appears to be moving faster than the rate of increase of transistors. And I think there's some logic to that. And the reason for that is ex exactly as I described, is because we thought across the entire stack. Well. Uh, for many of you who have been coming here for close to 10 years, I want to tell you how much I appreciate all of your support. We come here, we come here, because the work that we do is impossible otherwise. The work that we do is impossible otherwise. The work that we do in creating virtual reality is impossible otherwise. The work that we do in computer graphics, the work that you do in fluid dynamics is impossible otherwise. In molecular dynamics, it is impossible otherwise. There are several regions, several domains that we have found 
accelerated computing to be incredibly effective. Of course, graphics, physics, quantum mechanics, and a new field called deep learning. GTC has been growing so fast. It has been growing incredibly fast since our very beginning. We now have increased by a factor of three in five years, the number of attendees. Now, the only reason why it hasn't grown, grown faster is because of the fact that computing is all over the world. Since last year, starting last year, we've taken GTC on the road. Last year alone, last year alone, over 20,000 people came to GTCs around the world. And this year, we're gonna take this show on the road again so that we can make this computing platform available for developers, scientists, and researchers for your groundbreaking work all over the world. The number of GPU developers has increased by a factor of 10 in five years. It's actually amazing, 500,000 developers. It's taught all over the world. Textbooks are written all over the world. When you look at LinkedIn, you see CUDA all over the place. It's just fantastic. The number of people who, use G, who now consider GPGPU or programming GPUs or programming CUDA, one of their specialties is really fantastic to see. And then over a million CUDA downloads. The CUDA driver, the CUDA software SDK has been downloaded over a million times at GTC this year. Every one of the top 15 technology companies in the world are here. 100% of the world's top 15 technology companies are here. 10 out of the world's top 10 car companies are here. Pfizer, Merck, and Roche, GSK, Amgen, Lilly are here. Researchers from the world's top 100 national laboratories are here. There are 80 AI startups here. 25 VR startups. All kinds of robotic startups and ideas. GTC is where, if you will, the future is invented. GTC is where we create what other people would think of as science fiction. And speaking of science fiction, my first demonstration for you today is the holodeck. As you know, we play at the intersection of virtual reality and artificial intelligence. We play at the, at the intersection. And nothing exemplifies that intersection like Holodeck does. And the Holodeck is not only a place you go, but it's a place we can share. And so it has to obey the laws of physics, otherwise it wouldn't feel like a place. It has to be photorealistic, and it has to be some place that we can mm. share together. And so I thought, gosh, you know, what can we share together? What can we share together? And so I, I thought it would be great to invite a friend uh, to join us from Sweden. And he's not, he's, uh, he's actually a pretty special guy. His name is Christian Koenigsegg. Do you guys know Christian Koenigsegg? <laughs> Christian Koenigsegg is a car maker. Not a normal car maker, left hand. a hyper car maker. And that's a description of him, not the car. Nice. Come on. <laughs> Guys, help me out here. That was, that was exactly, that was incredibly fast thinking on my feet. <laughs> there are many more jokes to come. Watch. Some of it is just going to be right in here. It's incredible. And so, so I invited Koenigsegg to come and show us something that most people have never seen and um, uh, to enjoy the Koenigsegg Regera. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go into the holodeck. Hey, guys. Hey, hey, Christian, which one are you? Uh, Christian? Just stepped out. He'll be right back. <laughs> he went to the bathroom. Everybody was waving. All right. Okay. So, so this is uh, this is Nvidia's holodeck. Uh, we have we have people in it from um, all over the world. And um, uh, the thing that's really 
<laughs> I, I think it's just incredibly cute that they're all wearing name tags so they know who each other, <laughs> who each other. That's very funny. Okay, so why don't you guys take us through? Let's let's see the brand new Koenig set, shall we? You guys know this is the hol the holodeck works. This is all completely in real time. This is photorealistic graphics. This is this is what why it's so fun to work at Nvidia. Man, oh man. Hey, so Christian, what do you think about the car? Tell us about the car. Christian? Yeah. Can you hear him? No? What happened? Wow. Yeah. Well, can you hear me now, Justin? Well, Great. don't don't breathe like Darth Vader. <laughs> okay. So, Christian, t first of all, tell us about your car. So this this car this car is a hypercar. It's a it's a V8 twin turbo with three electric motors in it, right? So take it from there. Yeah. So this is uh, our latest creation. It's a hybrid car uh, with direct drive, uh, no gears. We have a combustion engine with uh, up to 1,200 horsepower and then 680 horsepower of electric drive. So this car doesn't need any gears to go from zero to 250 miles per hour in only 20 seconds. It's really one of the absolute fastest cars ever produced for road use and uh, something I'm very proud of. And seeing it in this environment is just amazing. Uh, um, trying out this uh, system with you guys uh, really changing, changes the view of what's possible, uh, how to create the cars and showcase them during the building process. It's just fantastic. Now, Christian, you know that, you know that the first time... <laughs> <laughs> right, it was... Uh, in California. It was street league in, in the rest of the U.S. But yeah, 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 whatever. Direct. Whatever. And so, so I just want to let you know I drove it anyways. And, and, and the, thing that, the thing that was really great is that, that um, whenever, whenever I get stopped, uh, it's never by a police. It's usually by an old lady who would like to take a picture of, of her grandson in the car. Um, but, but, um, yeah. uh, but I had the perfect excuse. I, I was going to say that if, if I got stopped, I was going from, I'm taking the car to the showroom. And apparently that was going to work because you told me that would work. <laughs> <laughs> and that it was okay to drive an illegal car. All right, so let's take a look at this. Everything here is carbon fiber. Let's, uh, yeah, let's so go inside it. Let's go inside it. Uh, let's take a look. Amanda, please. Amanda, let's take a look. All right. And remember, everything obeys the laws of physics. So if she were to grab the steering wheel, her hands don't go through it. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at that. OK, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, come on out, come on out. Let's, don't you guys have an x-ray feature or something like that so that we could see through the car? I mean, I just want to make sure that the entire car design is there. Every single body part is in here. This is not just a, a video game car. This is actually a computer-aided design car. This is the, this database, this database came directly from Christian, and now that we have his database, we can 3D print it ourselves. <laughs> Look at that, isn't that amazing? But what if I wanna see like all the parts? I just want to do, do an inventory of the parts. Okay, you guys, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, enough fun. Ladies and gentlemen, Christian Koenigsegg, the holodeck, the holodeck. It is just so amazing to be in these environments together with all your colleagues and you're talking to each other and, 
and you're pointing at the same thing. And because you could touch things, you could actually lift things up. And because you're in that environment and you're superhuman, it reacts to physics, but you can lift up amazing things. And so the holodeck is such a great place. The first part of our, so the first dynamic is the emergence, the rise of GPU computing. The second thing that happened started, happened uh, several years ago. And in fact, some would call this the second era, not of, not of processing, but the second era of computing altogether. As you know, when you guys are doing a search on Google, um, somehow it magically knows uh, what kind of information you're interested in. Uh, when you're doing, uh, watching movies on Netflix, somehow it magically knows what, it, what are other movies that you would enjoy. And when you're shopping on Amazon, it's amazing that every single page is personalized for you. And that it knows, based on the type of shopping habits that you have, there are other things that you might be interested in. None of those programs were written as a sequence of instructions specifically by engineers. All of that was made possible by machine learning. It's learning from all of your behavior and all your interactions with, with that service, and over time, it becomes more and more predictive. It is almost able to anticipate your needs. Machine learning is one of the most important computer revolutions ever. Whereas computer scientists used to specify every single instruction a line at a time, now algorithms write algorithms. Software writes software. Computers are learning by themselves. Machine learning, the era of machine learning. Pedro Domingos, the University of Washington professor, uh, wrote a really elegant book. And it's called The Master Algorithm. And he describes that there are five tribes in machine learning. The symbolists, people who use inverse deduction, induction. The Bayesians, probabilistic in, in, uh, inference. The an analogizers, the evolutionists, the ones that believe in genetic programming. These, five, these four approaches are also making enormous contributions in computer science. But one particular tribe called the connectionists have recently burst it into the public consciousness. This particular approach, which is now called deep learning, is the culmination of research breakthroughs from so many different labs, from Schmidt Huber's Swiss AI lab on using GPUs for convolution neural nets and the early uses of LSTM, long short-term memory, um, recurrent neural nets, to Jan LeCun's work with CNNs, to the groundbreaking work invention of back propagation, back propagation by Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto, the work that Feifei has done on ImageNet and computer vision at Stanford, and of course, uh, quite famous work by Andrew Ng on deep learning at Stanford as well. All of their works have come together into, if you will, kind of called the Big Bang of deep learning, the Big Bang of modern AI. And um, Feifei gave a talk recently where she uh, was talking about the search for intelligence. And she said that the Big Bang of AI, what made it possible were three fundamental ingredients. The breakthrough of deep learning was made possible by three things. Of course, the culmination of all of those great ideas that came together into the deep learning algorithm and the deep learning approach. The second is the availability of an enormous amount of data. And third is the discovery of using GPUs to accelerate deep learning, the training of deep learning, the development of the network, the model. Well, that combination set off in 2012 one of the most amazing progress in computer science. That culmination, that Big Bang, allows computers to magically look at an image, determine what's the important features, learn the features hierarchically, from pixels to curves to objects, for example, my face, 
my ear, my nose, my eyes, to eventually turn it into a face, and my face. That it learned it hierarchically and was able to represent knowledge, represent information in this way by extracting it out of raw data all by itself. It is able to look at a picture of me and recognize that it is me. It is not only robust, it is diverse. It could recognize me in the sun, in the dark, with a hat on, half of my face occluded in shadow, maybe slightly turned away. It could recognize other people. It can generalize. The ability for these networks to not only be robust and diverse and generalize allows us to solve one of the great challenges of computer science up to this point, which is perception. Sensing the real world, sensing raw data, whether it's visual or audio or otherwise. It could be vibration, it could be tremors, it could be temperature, it could be um, access to your data storage on, on your, in your corporate, uh, corporate storage. And all of a sudden, boom, by solving this problem, we just went on a massive race since 2012. One breakthrough after another was made possible because of it. Self-driving cars, the ability Baidu using computer vision, translating it to text. Google self-tagging all the photographs that you upload. You no longer have to tell it where this picture was taken. It figures it out. You could, you could, you could ask it for all of your pictures of, of uh, beaches and it'll find it for you. For the very first time, a deep learning network that was trained by data, not, by, not coded by engineers, not coded by computer scientists, was FDA approved for medical imaging, cardiac medical imaging. And it just keeps on going. Recurrent neural nets came along. The ability for neurons, these networks, to learn time sequence information so that it can understand sequences of text that turns into words, sequence of words that turns into paragraphs. All of a sudden, we have speech recognition that are superhuman. We have the ability to now look at a video and caption it automatically. So this piece of software has learned what is in the video and what it means. Captioning. Another architecture came along called reinforcement learning, where the network is given a value system and it tries and tries and tries and tries again exhaustively until it figures out how to improve itself towards the value system. Reinforcement learning how we learned to just about do everything. As a result of that, one network called AlphaGo was able to beat the world's champion in Go called AlphaGo, and it was, a, it was a feat that nobody thought would be possible for another 20 years. Robots are learning how to translate computer vision sight to kinematics, hand-eye coordination, and it keeps on going. And now we have unsupervised learning. We have the ability to use autoencoders to enhance images, to fill in the, bro the, the missing spots. And then a breakthrough came along this last year, or start, I guess, I guess uh, Ian Goodfellow's paper was 2014, but this last couple of years, it's really taken off. Adversarial networks, training two networks at the same time. One network's job is to fool the second network, and the second network's job is to not be fooled. And so it's a little bit like one network learning how to be Picasso and generating images and paintings of Picasso, while the second network is learning how to discriminate whether it is truly Picasso or not. When you're done training this network, what you end up with is a network that is able to draw like Picasso, and you have another network that is able to recognize images and recognize paintings at a level of discrimination unheard of. Generative adversarial networks. As a result, all of a sudden, all of these new ideas for generation comes along. We could use, uh, we create things like style transfers, generating voice, the ability to fill in empty spots or missing spots in photographs, natural language translation, to go from one language to another language, and to learn it, learn a pair of languages and then transfer that learning to other pairs of languages. So you learn how to translate from German to Spanish, and all of a sudden, how, all of a sudden you're able to learn how to understand from, translate from uh, English to, to, uh, to Spanish equally well. Zero-shot learning, transfer learning. These just 
spotlight a few of the examples. The number of papers in deep learning is just absolutely explosive. There's no way to keep up. And it's literally everywhere in the world. That big bang, that second, mo that second dynamic of computing, the big bang of deep learning has programs. Automation of automation. Computers that program computers. Artificial intelligence. Let me give you an example of something that we've been working on. We also, in our company, we do a fair amount of deep learning uh, research. Let me give you an example of what's actually happening here. Basically, this, this network in the middle, this is just an articulation of the network, it's called an autoencoder. We're, we're asking this network, we're asking this network, if we gave it a distorted image of that, a noisy image of that, that it has to learn how to generate th that image, the beautiful image, from that noisy image. The way that it has to do that, it has to figure out how to recognize the important features and eventually generate it automatically. Now, one of the areas we've applied this to is ray tracing. Ray tracing, as you know, is computationally incredibly intensive following photons around as we, as we try to regenerate an image is very computationally intensive. And so one of the things that we, we decided to do is what happens if we were to teach a network to fill in the spots that we haven't rendered yet, okay? To generate some of it and to automatically infer or to use artificial intelligence to decide what to fill it in with. And so let's take a look at that. This is um, our ray tracer with deep learning. On the left, let's see, on the left here is without deep learning, on the right is with deep learning. Notice how noisy it remains for some time. With deep learning, it figured out, based on the surrounding things that it has already rendered, and based on recognizing what objects look like, what paint looks like, what glass looks like, it's learned those things, and it selected the right picture, the, selected the right colors to fill it in with, all by itself. And as a result, you're able to take this noisy image and turn it into a beautiful image. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> the implication is actually quite amazing. We can now get distorted input from the sky, uh, from the internet, and somehow we could have a network running here that regenerates what it's likely to be, okay? Autoencoders, de using deep learning for computer graphics. That's great, thanks guys. Now this particular image, let's take a look at this. This is the full scene, yeah, let me not forget this. This is now the full scene. Now let's do the ult ultimate stunt, let's go outside. And just like that, it fills it in. And it, fill it recognizes that it's a reflection of trees, and it renders a reflection of trees. Okay, fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Using deep learning for ray tracing. The AI revolution is well on its way. It started with the Big Bang in 2012, but since then it has grown incredibly. There's just amazing things that are happening. If you take a look at the major conferences, NIPS, ICML, CVPR, and ICLR, the attendees has doubled in two years. It's only doubled in two years because there are li limitations in physical space. The number of students who want to learn deep learning has 10 x in two years on Udacity. The number one most popular course on Stanford, at Stanford, is CS229, Introduction to Machine Learning. The most popular course, you would have thought home, home ec was, but it, the most popular course is, is not, is not uh, being a movie critic anymore. It's machine learning. And in fact, I understand that it's not just engineers, not computer scientists, but it's psychologists, it's biologists, it's oceanographers, it's basically everybody. Deep learning has democratized computing. Not everybody knows how to program, but everybody has data. 
Everybody has their own data. And they could use that data now, use the experience of their domain, the experience of their career, the experience of their professionals, professions, and teach a computer how to automate their work. So teaching computers is something that I think everybody can do. We have democratized computing. And then lastly, the number of startups has just have been explosive. Of course, building great GPUs, but building great systems and system softwares and all the middleware that goes with it. The invention of QDNN so that we containerized, we turned into a library the really complicated numerics and mathematical pro uh, processing of all of the layers, the convolution layers, the activation layers, the pooling layers, all of those complicated layers into a easy to use library has been completely revolutionary. We've kept on going. There's all kinds of libraries that we've created now for the deep learning SDK that's available to framework designers and deep learning engineers all over the world. We work with every single one of the framework providers in the world. We have engineers that are working with each and every one of them so that we can integrate and optimize and make as wonderful as possible and as productive as possible these complicated frameworks which are basically high performance computing software stacks to run on NVIDIA GPUs. Every single framework on the planet supports CUDA. Every single framework on the planet supports NVIDIA GPUs. And it doesn't matter which one you use. They, some of them have their own special characteristics. Some of them are better for research. Some of them are better for production. Some of them are better for, for cloud. Some of them are better for enterprise. Some of them are better for uh, the highest possible performance. Some of them are better for flexibility. There are so many different frameworks, and we support them all. We also work with the system companies to make sure that irrespective of how you would like to access a high performance computer, whether you would like to build it yourself by going to the store and buying yourself a GeForce Titan X, or buying a fully integrated server from one of the world's large OEMs, our partners HP, Dell, and IBM, Cisco, and Lenovo, or you would like to provision it in the cloud. One of the best ways to enjoy deep learning is for someone else to build this incredibly complicated supercomputer on your behalf. And so we've worked with all of the cl cloud providers, and at this point, every single cloud company in the world has NVIDIA GPUs provisioned in the cloud. And so with this strategy, we have accelerated the capability of deep learning, made it compatible with literally every single framework on the planet, and made it available to you however you would like to access it. But we didn't stop there. There are several things that we're doing. Because we realize what an important computing revolution this is, and that we can't just make the computers for it, that we have to understand how deep learning works and how AI, how AI will impact society, Bill Daly and our NVIDIA research is doing basic research in deep learning. We also have applied research. I showed you one example of our applied research. We're doing applied research in a whole bunch of areas. I'll talk about some of them today. We also partner with the world's top AI laboratories, whether it's University of Toronto or Stanford or Berkeley or Oxford or Harvard or MIT or um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Tsinghua University or the University of Tokyo. We have some 20 some odd universities that we work with around the world where the greatest, the brightest minds in artificial intelligence are supported and working directly with us. One of the most important programs that we have in the company is called Inception. And many of them, many of you in the audience are part of this program. There are 1,300 startups that we're working with today that are focused on deep learning. You need access to early access to technology. You need access to resources. You need access maybe to expertise. You need access to market exposure. 
Sometimes you need access to funding. We have access and we provide all of that as part of Inception. 1,300 companies came out of nowhere. This program is literally 18 months old. There are all kinds of great companies here. Deep Genomics and Healthcare, Zebra and Healthcare, Medical Imaging. We have, um, in, uh, we have uh, Financial Services, FinTech. We have Retail and Etail. Uh, there's Autonomous Machines, amazing, cool autonomous machines. Where we only talk about self-driving cars a lot. Zooks has a self-driving uh, taxi that they're building. There's Drive AI, who's building a software stack on top of Drive PX. Amazing companies out there. Blue River is using autonomous machines to make it easier for farmers to fertilize their fields. One particular company that I want to mention that's really, really cool, and it's, it's, a, it's a company that is, um, in fact, not working on deep learning. It's just the technology that they, they create is so vital to almost everybody who's working in big data. And it's a company called MapD. Uh, Todd Mostek's company uh, was the world's first to create basically a database engine on top of GPUs. And he's been working on this for quite a few years. And he just recently open sourced MapD. You should all take a look at it. It's just completely amazing to be able to access databases so large, completely in memory, and be able to interact with it, create graphs out of it, query it with AI, visualize it all in real time. Completely revolutionary stuff. So 1,300 startups in inception, and um, we're just delighted and really, really proud of all of them. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Deep learning and enterprise. SAP is one of the world's largest enterprise software companies. And recently, they re reached out to us and wanted to partner with us on deep learning. And our two engineering teams have been working together on a new product that is just super, super cool. It's called Brand Impact. And the way that this works is this. There are videos being shown to, by advertisers. And, um, uh, and they spend some $60 billion a year advertising their brands and adver advertising products. But they really have no idea how effective they are. So let me run this video for you, and you get a sense for it. SAP Brand Impact is a fully automated and scalable video analytics service for brands, media agencies, and media production companies. Detected brand assets are framed in the video and correspond to the lines in the panel below. It allows interactive review of original video footage overlaid with detections. In the summary view, you get reports on brand exposure duration and size on the screen. In the detailed view, you get indication of each brand's screen coverage and frequency of exposure graph. SAP Brand Impact Solution, accelerated by NVIDIA, enables customers to measure the impact of brand exposure on their business performance. It makes so much sense. It makes so much sense for SAP to be working on deep learning. And the reason for that is this. You guys know that some 80% of the world's commerce is, flows through the SAP ERP system. Almost 90% of the world's largest enterprises have their databases all uh, within the, the uh, SAP uh, ERP system. So they're sitting on a pile of data. Companies who are using SAP are sitting on a pile of data. If we could figure out a way to use AI so that we could harvest, so that we could, f we could find insight in that dark matter, it would be incredibly valuable. It's one of the reasons why we partnered up with, with SAP and the results of it. This is the first results of it, and you're gonna see a lot more to come. Well, there's so many different startups that are emerging all over the world. But the part of it that's really, so you're seeing startups that are emerging, number of applications is exploding, the number of industries that are being touched by this, and simultaneously, simultaneously, the, com the complexity of the models are exploding. I mean, this is Microsoft's ResNet, the groundbreaking work that achieves superhuman levels, has seven sextillion operations, seven exaflops. Okay, seven exaflops. Um, just to give you a, a sense, if you took all of the world's fastest supercomputers, all top 500 of them, you put them all together, and you cause, you, if you could figure out a way to cause them to operate for one second together, that is one exaflops. So what this network, this model that 
Microsoft created called the ResNet, really, really super deep, the deepest network at the time, it would take seven seconds, seven seconds, for every single supercomputer on the planet, the ones, all the ones in the United States, all the ones in China, all the ones in Europe, you gang them all together, it would take seven seconds to process this network. Okay, that's how much operation is inside. Very few of us think about the word sextillion every day. These are big numbers. These are a whole bunch of numbers, and that is what a program looks like in the future. Well, the program is getting larger and larger. Baidu has, has a, a, a network, a model, that's 20 exaflops large with 300 million numbers inside it, and that's called Deep Speech 2. And Google's recent neural machine translator that does multi-language translation requires 105 exaflops. The amount of computation necessary is just incredible. In fact, it would take approximately one server, one CPU-only server, two years to run through this network one time. This is the ultimate high-performance computing problem. And that's one of the reasons why we have to continue to push the, li the living daylights out of computing. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you now to the next chap chapter of computing. V100. This is made out of TSMC's 12, nan 12 nanometer FinFET, and um, I'm just getting a little exercise up here. 12 nanometer FinFET. The part that is really shocking is this is reticle limits. Reticle limits basically means that it is at the limits of photolithography, meaning you can't make a chip any bigger than this because the transistors would fall on the ground. Every single transistor that is possible to make by today's physics was crammed into this processor. 21 billion processors, almost 100 billion vias, little connectors, 100 billion vias, to make one chip work per 12-inch wafer, I would characterize it as unlikely. And so the fact that this is manufacturable is great. It's just an incredible feat. 800 millimeters squared. If you guys have an Apple Watch on your wrist, the die size is approximately like that. Okay, so just take a look at your Apple Watch. Gives you a feeling for it. 5,000 processor cores in here, seven and a half teraflops of 64-bit floating point, 15 teraflops of 32-bit floating point, and a brand new type of processor. A brand new type of processor called Tensor Core, which results in 120 teraflops of tensor operations. 120 teraflops. Unbelievable. This, um, well, at the R&D budget is uh, approximately three billion, and this is the first one. So if anyone would like to buy this, it's three billion dollars. <laughs> I'll just stick that in my pocket. Um, the, the memory system in our, in our architecture is quite unique. If you take a look at the way that, that most, most uh, processors are organized, the register files are very small, the caches are very big, and the DRAM is quite large. In our case, the register file is huge, 20 megabytes of RF register file, so that the, the memory is very, very close to the processors, and that's one of the reasons why the throughput is so high, 16 megabytes of cache, and we're utilizing the state of the art, the fastest memories that the world can make today. It's made by Samsung. Our partnership with them is terrific. 
The two engineering teams have been working so closely together, pushing the limits, pushing the limits of how fast we can drive memories. And we've been able to achieve 900 gigabytes per second. It is just so fast. And then lastly, the second generation NVLink gives us 300 gigabytes per second, basically approximately 10 times the fastest PCI Express in the world today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Tesla V100. The Tesla V100, Volta has a new instruction inside. It's called the Tensor Core. It's a new CUDA tensor operation instruction that is both an instruction as well as data format. It's a four by four matrix. one of the most important primitives of deep learning, A times B plus C on a matrix. A times B plus C on a matrix. And so the input is A matrix, 4 by 4, 16-bit floating point, times B, 16-bit floating point, plus C. And we're trying to do that as fast as possible. So this is the way Pascal did it. And it did it incredibly fast at the time. And the reason why it's incredibly fast, every single row is multiplied by every single or every single, yeah, row is multiplied by every single column, and then when you're done, it accumulates, adds it all the way vertically into that green, the output results. And it does it incredibly fast because Pascal has thousands of processors. Because that Pascal is doing this thousands of times at the same time. And that's the reason why Pascal was so fast. However, we felt that that just wasn't fast enough. What we should do is do it in parallel and in parallel. And so this is what the Volta Tensor Core does. It literally does the 4 by 4 multiply plus C at the same time. And it dumps it into result, 20 times increased throughput. <laughs> really crazy stuff. The net result is although Pascal, the P100, is the most advanced processor the world's ever built, one year later, one year later, Volta is one and a half times the floating point performance general purpose computing, 12 times the tensor operations compared to Pascal for deep learning training, and six times for inferencing. I'm going to come back to inferencing a little bit. Inferencing, of, inferencing for all of you who are not familiar, training the network is the first step. Very computationally intensive. And the second step, also computationally intensive, not as intensive, but computationally intensive, is inferencing the production, the application of the network. Well, that's, that's Volta. That's V100. And um, let's, let's go through a couple of quick demos. You know, you guys know that, that um, uh, it's a GPU. So although I haven't spoken much about graphics, it is able to do graphics. And so 10 days ago, 10 days ago, I reached out to Dabata-san. Tabata-san is, is um, the head of the studio at Square Enix. And this is, as you know, the 30 years of Square, and they're well known around the world for their, the, the incredible cinematic production value of their films and video games. And with, with this generation, with Final Fantasy XV, his vision, Tabata-san's vision, was to, to unify the pipeline, unify the workflow, unify the graphics engine of cinematic film and real-time computer graphics with a vision that someday cinematic film and computer graphics have essentially the same visual effects. And so 10 days ago, I reached out to Dabata-san and I, I asked him if he, if he could you know, do something for all of you. And he just jumped on the opportunity. He, first of all, he apologized. He said, look, I just don't, there's not enough time to really do anything um, at the level that Square would like to do. However, he dedicated his engineers. They worked around the clock. They basically haven't gone to sleep for 10 days. And let's take a look at the great gift that Tabata-san and the Square Enix guys have done for us. Fur simulators, leather simulators. The amount of geometry in here, the lighting system, the soft shadows. The character is directly out of the movie. 
metal looks like metal, you can almost touch the leather. That's a good leather jacket. Guys, that's a good leather jacket. I just noticed that. That's a good leather. I'm going to have to call it Tabata Sun. Okay. Good job. Amazing. And so, so uh, he, also sent us, he also sent us what he believes that it will look like someday in the near future. And this is what video games will look like. Ladies and gentlemen, a quick trailer. King's Clave. That's how I want my video game to look. This engine is called the Luminous Engine. It in incorporates 100% of all the physics processing that we developed in GameWorks and all the particle systems you saw, the explosions, the fire, all of the destruction. So beautiful. All made possible because of NVIDIA physics engine. Well, let's think about, let's look at something new. Several years ago, when we announced Kepler, which was a groundbreaking GPU. It was our first double precision. It was our first double precision GPU. It is the GPU that ended up in our nation's fastest supercomputer, the Oak Ridge Titan. It is the namesake of the GeForce Titan X, as in the fastest supercomputer in our nation, the fastest supercomputer you can build for yourself, the Titan X. Several years ago, we demonstrated Kepler simulating the future of our world. You know, people always look at the past of our world. By looking at all the images from the sky, and we could, we could learn about how our universe was created and informed. But very few people really think about how our universe is going to turn out. Well, in order to figure out how our universe is going to turn out, we have astrophysicists in our company. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we're super proud of is we have computer vision experts. We have astrophysicists. We have quantum chemists. We have all of these, we have molecular biologists. We have people who are expert in these computational sciences so that we can work with all of you to advance your work. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Jones is going to give us what the galaxy looks like billions of years from now. Okay, Steven. So, um, it looked like a piece of artwork, but that is actually a live simulation. It's, uh, we're showing an end-body simulation code here, courtesy of Jeroen Bedorf and Simon Portachis Svart of Leiden Observatory. And this is a simulation of the Andromeda galaxy um, on the right-hand side. And it's hey, inevitable. Steven, wait, wait. I need your demo to last less than a billion years. All right, I, let's I, get going. I've with got it. a few. <laughs> it's All not right. moving. So we'll start. So yeah, we're following the Andromeda here, and it's flying in towards the Milky Way, and in five billion years, about four billion years, it's going to make a close pass, it's going to swing past us, and it's going to start spinning stars off the Milky Way and the Andromeda, but gravity is going to inevitably take over. And what you can see, we're, we're running this on Volta, and the number of stars, we can simulate 100 million bodies per second, we can see the bar structure of the Milky Way right there, right next to us, as it comes plunging back for its second pass towards the core of the Andromeda galaxy. And then the cores get much closer, and you start seeing stars being flung off to all sides. One of the amazing things is you can look out into the universe, and you can see galaxies colliding in just this way. And you see the same kinds of structures. I see these stars being thrown off in waves as the cores orbit each other and then finally merge. And so about 5.3 billion years, you can see the timer in the corner there, the merge is finally, this is it. This is the moment when all the stars get thrown away. And we get left with one single giant galaxy, the fusion of the two, with a whole pile of stars, probably including our sun, unfortunately, just flung out into the universe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so, so, so the, amazing thing, the, the amazing thing about that demonstration, before I go into the next one, the amazing thing about that demonstration is this. Five years ago, when we showed it to you on Kepler versus today, basically was 
eight times, seven to eight times performance improvement in five years. Seven to eight times improvement in five years. So if you say seven to eight times performance in five years, and during that same time, the microprocessor has improved in performance by about 50%. Okay, 50%. Another way to think about it is seven to eight times in five years is basically about 70% per year, the benefits of accelerated computing. Okay, so one of, the, one of the really important, and only at NVIDIA would engineers love so much watching galaxies make love. That's, that's science porn right there, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, everybody. That was incredible. It's just beautiful. Okay, now let's talk about deep learning. So recently, Cornell did a paper that was really amazing. So what they were able to do is you guys know that, that it's now possible to take two pieces of art, um, learn, the, learn, learn, learn the style of Picasso or Monet or Van Gogh, and you could apply it to a photograph, and it turns your photograph into a Monet. Okay, turns your photograph into a money. It's called style transfer. Well, the, the Cornell team, um, Dr. Bala's team, uh, realized that, that uh, what is left behind is, an, is, is artistic, meaning that, that uh, it's distorted. The photograph is now distorted. It no longer retains its original fidelity. It doesn't look like what it used to look like. The buildings don't look like buildings anymore. Um, they kind of look like buildings. Uh, it applies art to cats and dogs and grass. And so what they would like to do is photographic style transfer. You learn the style from one photograph and you apply it to another photograph. You learn the style from one photograph, you, learn, you apply it to another photograph. Basically the way it works, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it off. Julie, the Marais, please. Did I say it right? The Marais, the Marais, the Marais. The Marais. The Marais. I said that so that Madison could hear it. She's in France and she's gonna, the Marais. The Marais? Yeah, the Marais. that means yes. the start, all of you. Okay, all right, so go. Do I have to click? All right, Julie. The Marais, s'il vous plaît. Julie is one of our deep learning computer scientists, and she speaks French. One, one photograph, this is the first photograph, we're gonna learn the style of that. Okay, next, please, keep on going. And we're gonna to try to apply it to this one. Now, the thing that it has to understand is it has to understand the structure as well as the style. It has to understand the structure as well as the style because it needs to apply the right style to the right areas of the photograph. And so, it needs to understand a building's a building, a cat's a cat, you know, water's water, the walkway's a walkway, the clouds are clouds, and when it applies it, it generates it. It's drawing the pixels one at a time, regenerating the photograph in this new style. And, and when the Cornell engineers um, wrote the paper, they used the Titan X to do that, and it took three to four minutes to process this image. This is now on Volta. Go ahead, fire it away. And so it starts out, here's this artificial intelligence network. It's trying to draw this image. It's trying to generate this image from scratch. It took this... These, this style and this image, and it says, I want to recreate something that is photographic. And notice the beach looks like the beach, the clouds still look like clouds, and somehow the style of that image has now been applied to this image. Pretty great. Thank you. Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> Inserting that French in my mind just made me lose my, tr my track. We're in trouble. Okay, so deep learning. Deep learning style transfer. Now, what was possible on Titan X in several minutes is now possible in a few seconds. And you can now kind of get a sense for what deep learning can do, what the artificial intelligence network is able to do. It's able to generate an image based on what you teach it. Now, it, it didn't just learn from these two images. It had to learn structure from lots and lots of images. It had to understand what are important features from lots and lots of images. And after it's done learning all of that, you could give it two new images and say, I want you to take this structure, this image, and apply the art, the style, to this image. And it just does it all by itself. 
The performance of deep learning is everything. CAFE 2 is a framework that we worked on with, with the team at uh, Facebook, and uh, recently they announced that CAFE 2 is now going to be Voto ready. It's really delightful to work with them, and our engineers are working really closely together. These frameworks are incredibly complicated. We worked also with Microsoft on their Cognitive Toolkit. One of the things that's really great about the Microsoft Toolkit is that it's able to scale incredibly well. Let me show you the numbers. If you look at CAFE 2, the Kepler performance, eight Keplers, eight supercomputing GPUs, was able to train this network in 40-something hours, 40-something hours, basically almost two days, almost two days. Last year with Pascal, you can get a DGX1 box and you can train that same network basically within a day. And now with Volta and P100, you can t train that network in a shift. The productivity of these engineers is so vital, and the reason for that is because there's so few of these amazing deep learning scientists, and their time is scarce. The productivity of deep learning, the magic of deep, deep learning is so great that everybody wants to jump on this and get products to market. And so the pressure on all of these engineers and scientists to deliver is incredible. That's one of the reasons why there's so many acquisitions happening all over the world. Now, when you finally get those engineers, you want to make sure that they have the best possible technology, the most productive environment to develop their network on. So the difference between having to wait for two days versus literally one shift is groundbreaking, but you want more than that. And so CNT, oh, excuse me, Microsoft's Cognitive Toolkit, which used to be called CNTK, can now train a network, multi-node training, of the ResNet 50 network, which is a really gigantic network, and it integrates our SDK called Nickel, collective, co collective communications, basically allowing all of the GPUs to work together as one big farm. They are able to scale 64 voltas together and turn what used to be days, hours, shifts, down to basically a couple of hours. A couple of hours. So with 64 voltas, Behind that deep learning scientist, now the iteration could, be, could happen much, much more quickly. One of the newest networks called, is called MXNet. Incredibly popular, and it's grown, come out of nowhere, and it's growing like a weed. Everybody loves it because it's so scalable, it's flexible, and we're working with Amazon to enhance it for Volta. And recently they benchmarked it on Volta and using LSTM, which is a, a network for time sequence learning, we're able to improve the performance dramatically from previous years. And so now we can train in, on one GPU alone, MXNet could be trained in just several hours. To come and share some of their insight about the work that they're doing in artificial intelligence, we have a special guest with us today. This is Mad Wood, the general manager of artificial intelligence for Amazon. We're so happy to have you come and join me on stage here. Hey, Matt. Good morning. Welcome. Hey, Justin. How you doing? Great to have you. Hey. So, so first of all, you know, I think that that um, everybody knows about uh, Amazon's artificial intelligence effort, even though you guys have been working on it for so long. They really, really learned about it because of Echo and Alexa. Yeah, I mean, we have been uh, working with machine learning and deep learning for over 20 years at Amazon, yeah. and it's become one of the uh, one of the arrows in our quiver, really across the organization from fulfillment all the way through to the work we're doing in taking this magical technology and giving it to all developers through AWS, through defining entirely new categories of products and experiences like Echo, Echo Look, and Amazon Go. Yeah, one of, the first, one of my first uh, recollections of Amazon was when Jeff said that there, he was gonna have millions of books in the store. <laughs> and I still remember the book, the book company, the traditional book company said, oh, there's no way you could have two million books in a store <laughs> because who's gonna go through two million books? Right. Well, the reason, for, the reason for that is because they didn't understand machine learning. That's and right, you, and one of our very, very early um, usage of machine, machine learning was in driving discovery and search on our retail site. Mm -hmm. So the famous customers who, also, who bought this also bought is all driven through machine learning, and that's really now uh, uh, used extensively across the site for search, discovery, summarization, you name it. If you're using, shopping on Amazon.com, you're interacting in some way with machine and deep learning systems under the hood. Now, Amazon has multiple pillars of, of, um, uh, of strategy.
there's another pillar that has to do with robotics and, and the work that you guys do with Echo and Alexa. And then there's another, the new, the new pillar that you guys introduced, I guess, about last year, was taking all of this technology that you guys have invented and putting it up on the cloud so that everybody, every developer, every startup company in the world, every enterprise in the world, could benefit from these pre-trained networks of yours um, and uh, create applications based on AI. That's right. So the, the original goal with Amazon Web Services, the very, very first business case, was to be able to take technology that was only within reach of a very, very small number of very, very well-funded organizations and put that uh, within reach of any developer anywhere. And you can see that that's been used now with millions of developers active on the platform every single month. Uh, and we're doing the exact same approach as we took with compute and enterprise data warehousing and applying it to deep learning and artificial intelligence mm -hmm. using computer vision models, speech systems, speech recognition, natural language understanding, and doing a lot of work in driving Apache MXNet uh, forward for all developers. Uh, we've seen and um, been able to work together, our, our two teams, uh, really to optimize MXNet for Volta. Uh, we couldn't be more excited. We've seen amazing performance improvements, both in training and inference. And we're really excited to be a launch partner for when Volta becomes available. And we'll make Volta uh, available as, as the uh, foundation for our next general purpose GPU instance at launch. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the support. All right. Thanks. Now, every, everybody in the audience probably wants to know the same thing I want to know. <laughs> what's, the, what's the funniest question that Alexa gets? The funniest question that Alexa gets. Uh, you know what? It, it's this almost is PG, always. PG, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's all, actually almost always from kids. Uh -huh. um, I bought a new uh, uh, Echo Dot. Uh, you can order it by, just by asking Alexa for it. It arrived. Uh, I took it out of the box, and uh, my son was with me. And, and he said, Hey, Dad, can I hold her? Uh, not can I hold it, but can I hold her? And the affinity that customers have mm -hmm. for Alexa uh, mm -hmm. is really incredible and growing every day. We have a, a remarkable ecosystem, both of devices uh, from Amazon, uh, third parties integrating Alexa into their own uh, cars and refrigerators, mm -hmm. and also 10,000, more than 10,000 Alexa skills available on the platform today. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a bustling ecosystem, which I encourage everyone to experiment with. And so one, one more question that, I, that, that I'm, I'm dying to know about. You, you know, Amazon today has the world's largest scale of GPU cloud. And, and uh, I remember Andy telling me that, that when you guys rolled out the GPU into the cloud, it was the fastest yeah. growing instance that Amazon ever had. And, and uh, I, guess, I guess my question is, is how did you guys, what did you guys see, what, how did you guys know that people wanted GPU in the cloud, and, and why did you guys do it in the first place? Yeah, I mean, it, it really came from customer feedback. About 90% of our roadmap at AWS is driven mm -hmm. directly from what customers ask us for. And they were really asking for NVIDIA chips available with utility pricing and availability. And so we made that available. We've been working together for, for years. Uh, our most recent instance, the P2, uh, is just growing like wildfire. Uh, it's being used extensively for deep learning in virtually every vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, we see uh, medical imaging, uh, uh, in, in, even in regulated workloads. One of your examples earlier, the, the FDA uh, approved regulated workload of deep learning uh, for medical imaging, all the way through to the best performing autonomous driving simulation, mm -hmm. uh, which is from a startup called Too Simple. Uh, they do everything from real time uh, per pixel object segmentation mm -hmm. uh, to centimeter accurate positioning of the car in three-dimensional space, all up and running on P2 using MXNet mm -hmm. on AWS today. That's amazing. Thank you very much, Thanks. Jeff. Thanks for Thanks, all the Jensen. support. Cheers. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Amazing work at Amazon, revolutionizing computing as we know it, creating the future with cloud computing. The first thing I want to announce is our brand new DGX1V. This has become the essential instrument of deep learning research. The work that they do, deep learning scientists that are, are so heavy, and building a supercomputer or a high-performance computing cluster takes a great deal of time. Integrating all the software into it to make it performant takes a great deal of time. And finding space for it takes a great deal of time. For many of them, they either aren't quite ready for the cloud, weren't quite ready for the cloud, or would like to have the ability to burst into the cloud. And so we created for developers the DGX1 supercomputing appliance dedicated to AI. With Volta, it has almost, almost, I wish, I wish I just had 40 teraflops more, because it would have been, it would have been wonderful to say. 960 tensor teraflops with eight GPUs inside. It can now take what takes what used to take eight days on tight next to train now the 
PGX1V? Yeah, is that beautiful? The DGX1V with eight Tesla Voltas. And call your operator because we're ready to take orders. You can order one today for $149,000. Come to nvidia.com. Have your credit card ready. <laughs> and we'll deliver it in Q3. Now, only for you, only for you in the room, everybody who places orders now, I'll give you, because Volta is not quite ready to ship now, it'll ship very soon. It'll ship Q3 and DGXs and Q4 from OEMs all over the world. For anybody who places orders today, starting today, you'll get a free upgrade to Volta when it arrives in Q3. DGX1V, $149,000, replaces 400 servers or approximately a couple of million dollars worth of equipment, and it comes out of the box, plug it in, and it go to work. Well, we've been asked so many times, would it be nice, I don't have a data center, and I don't have cooling. I'm a startup, and I've got 10 engineers, and what we need right now is to get working on deep learning. Could you please make us a small version of DGX? And so, so uh, we, we thought, well, that's an interesting idea. So we, we prototyped up a few inside the company, and of course, Putting that much computing power next to an engineer, you really, really have to keep it quiet. So we liquid cooled it. We liquid cooled it. And it's whisper quiet. You can't hear it at all. And so, so we created it, and we can't make enough of it. Every single deep learning engineer in our company either has a DGX station or a DGX1 or both. Every single one of the engineers. And so... This is a, just a, an amazing, amazing uh, success inside a company. And so I decided that we would make it and make it available to deep learning engineers all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the D personal DGX, called the DGX Station. <laughs> and for those deep learning engineers, Tesla gets used in a DGX station in DGX1 for a personal AI supercomputer. The other way that we use it, of course, is putting it in the cloud. And one of the, one of the ways that we use it is putting it into a public cloud. When you put a service into a public cloud, GPUs are used in a whole lot of different ways. They might be used to train certain types of networks and different types of networks like different type of computer configurations. They might use it to run molecular dynamics. They might use it to run, as Matt was saying earlier, a segmentation or maybe even a simulation or computer graphics in the cloud. And so we need this computer to be very adaptable. One of the things that we did was we partnered with Microsoft to create the industry's first industry standard hyperscale cloud graphics accelerator. Notice there's a computer, one, there's a 1U computer underneath the server. And there's these four cables that come out from the base computer into the HGX1. And these, base, these cables are basically PCI Express and allows us to configure all kinds of different size services to the market. And of course, we still have the ability to virtualize the GPUs so that many instances can want to run on one GPU. This particular box is intended for the public cloud so that the versatility of service could expand the reach of the customer base. Whether you're using it for deep learning, or using it for graphics, or using it for CUDA HPC computation, HGX is really ideal. I'd love to have Jason Zander, who is the Vice President of Azure, come and join me. We've been partnered together for such a long time working on this. It's great to have you. Jason, welcome. 
Thank you, Jensen. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. You know, our companies work on, first of all, it, it, I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you're here. Uh, as you guys know, right now, simultaneously, uh, Satya and Harry Shum, the CTO and, C, well, CEO and the CTO of, of Microsoft, are up in Redmond doing almost exactly the same thing we are. Our build conferences they, it's today. It's called Build. Yep. And so I'm really grateful that you, yep. you took the time to come down here and spend it with us. Uh, we've been working with Microsoft for, gosh, 25 years. Yep. And, and uh, we have, we have uh, all kinds of developments going on. Recently, uh, we've been working on, of course, advancing deep learning uh, for internal research. And, and um, uh, very, very amazing, well, first of all, uh, Harry Shum, XD Huang are some of the world's pioneering AI researchers in speech. And the work that you guys did recently uh, to achieve superhuman levels in speech recognition was, was a complete groundbreaking endeavor. Uh, not only that, you guys were able to uh, create natural language uh, translation for real time Cortana. Yeah. So apparently Cortana now can understand 40 different languages. And of course, of course uh, you guys had a great groundbreaking work with ResNet uh, developing a very, very mm -hmm. deep, um, very sparse network that was, was uh, very powerful and achieved superhuman levels. Uh, this, this, this AI laboratory inside Microsoft uh, uses a framework uh, that they call the, cog in, back in the good old days, they yeah. call the CNTK, and which has now become the Cognitive Toolkit. Mm -hmm. And tell me, tell me about the, the work that you guys do there and, and how you guys are going to expose that to the rest of the world so that everybody else can have the benefits that Yeah, that thank you. you know, AI is a, a clear part of what we're trying to do. We want to infuse AI across our entire platform. So we start off with the platform, our partnerships that we have, cognitive services and frameworks like Cognitive Toolkit, and now you know, the, the Cognitive Toolkit used to be CNTK, but also into our applications, because we want users to be able to take advantage of that as well, and make sure that's available to them. And so we've been doing AI for a good 20 years now, if you think back to things like search relevancy, all the way out to things like Connect sensors on the Xbox, and most recently, HoloLens, mm -hmm. uh, and those environments. You mentioned the uh, real-time speech translation, the mm -hmm. Skype real-time translator. That's one of the most sophisticated language deep neural nets that are out there. It can take us hundreds of GPUs, we can spend an entire day running this thing through, but it's really cool because I can talk to someone in English and they can hear in Chinese and go back and forth and you say lots of languages. Can't do that without the power the Star of the Trek cloud. Universal Translator is going to happen. It's awesome. It's finally yeah. here. Really yeah, yeah. excited. And so, so I could just imagine, so that's right. So you guys are working on a HoloLens and a HoloLens, is, as, as, as you and I know, and it is real-time 3D reconstruction. It recognizes the 3D environment and, um, and it augments computer graphics and register it perfectly inside mm -hmm. reality, augments reality. And now if you supplement that with the Cortana natural language translator, you're able to walk up to uh, anybody from another country and, and you could talk in your language, they could yes. talk in their language, and the two of you could have a perfect conversation. It's really cool. I mean, the idea that I can trap photons and do things with it before it hits my eyeball is pretty awesome. So that's another exactly great place where we're able to leverage the work that we've done together because doing the API and algorithm validation on the back end for the HoloLens, also another thing we can use inside of the fleet. Mm -hmm. Combine that with real-time translation. Like you said, I can have this really cool uh, interaction uh, model that's there, and you can't do it without the deep partnership that we've had you know, already mm -hmm, so far. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have guessed that Microsoft is, would be one of the fastest growing cloud providers on the planet. <laughs> and in the last several years, your Azure business has, has just been on fire. And you have uh, had the support of Nat, Nat, Natia and, and, um, and, uh, uh, and everybody is, is uh, behind your business uh, pushing, pushing Microsoft Azure uh, into, into the world. And, and so tell me about some of the efforts there and talk to me about some of the, the collaboration that we have and, and how can we bring GPU computing to the world. Yeah, and it's really exciting times for us. So we, you know, this is, we're on our second generation of GPUs inside of the fleet. Uh, we're the first to bring in M60s and the, and the K80s. Uh, we've just announced the P40s and the P100s are coming. And then, of course, we really, really love the Volta work that's coming out. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that that goes out there as well. Look, I, you know, my job is to make sure that both my internal folks inside of Microsoft developers, they use the Azure cloud in order to be able to do their training. Look at the examples we just mentioned. And look, every time you come up with a new system that comes through, they want it tomorrow. And so our ability to come in and make sure that it's part of the training regime that we've got, it makes things go faster, like your benchmark showed. But then we also want to make sure that it's available to all of you. And we've done additional things. Uh, for example, our cognitive uh, services we've had out, we've actually had it out for about three years now. We've been uh, doing AI and speech and text and these APIs as part of the services on top of the Azure cloud. And we're bringing even more of those coming forward. In fact, we just announced the uh, Azure Batch AI training service that's out there, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. kind of, you know, our history is a lot of developer stuff, right? We want to democratize 
monetize that. And so we want you know, data scientists and, and basically developers that are working on models, let them concentrate on the models and the unique IP and value they add, and less on the plumbing. So you're going to see more and more of that coming through the system. Mm -hmm. We think it'll help accelerate some of the scenarios that you're showing. Yeah. Uh, it's really super exciting time. Well, Satya right is going to be super excited about the work that we're doing together. You guys announced yesterday the largest installation of GPU cloud that Azure's ever, ever announced. And so I'm super excited about that. Thank, thanks for your yeah. support, and thanks for support Revolta. Thank you so much. All right, Appreciate thanks, it. Jason. Thanks. Jason Zander, Corporate Vice President of Microsoft. Let me talk about inferencing. So now we've created this network, and it's taken hours and hours of deep learning training on DGX1 or in, in the Amazon cloud or in the Azure cloud with all these GPUs. Now that you have this network, this network can, is now ready to be deployed. And that network is still very computationally intensive. And we need to figure out a way to make that network run as fast as possible. There are two things that we are doing with Volta that is really, really special. The first, of course, is the Tensor Core that I mentioned earlier. It increases the throughput of training by a factor of 12, but it increases the throughput of inferencing by a factor of six, and I'm gonna show you the benefit of that. But the second thing is this. Whereas the frameworks are used for training the network, when you're done with it, it creates a graph, and that graph needs to be optimized and compiled for the processor that you're using. We call that needs to run in real time. And it, it comes, into the, comes, into our, comes into our software in the form of graphs. And so the first thing that we have to do is we have to interpret from each one of the frameworks, parse the, and, and uh, in, ingest from each one of the frameworks. The second thing we have to do is compile it, and the third, optimize it for each one of the targets. And each one of our GPUs has slightly different architectures. They have slightly different numerics precision, and we have to take advantage of each one of our GPUs. We call it TensorRT, Tensor Runtime, TensorRT graph optimization for vertical and, and horizontal layer fusion. So if you take a look at this, this is basically a neural network. There's the convolution layer, the bias layer, the, the, the rectified linear unit layer, and um, basically the activation layer. And this is one particular network, that a, a typical network. This, I believe, is AlexNet. What we do with it, the first thing that we do, we combine the mathematics that otherwise would have to be done in sequence into one big blob. And so we turned a, a ReLU, a bias, and a one-by-one one convolution into a one-by-one one convolution bias ReLU. And so that mathematical block um, is replaced. So by analyzing the graph, we could figure out where, which one of the mathematical operations we could fuse together and replace with something much more efficient. The second thing we could do is we could recognize when different mathematical blocks share uh, the same inputs. They have different outputs, but they share the same inputs. And that, again, is achieved through graph analytics. So we can, we can walk through the graph, we can analyze the graph, and recognize these different, different opportunities, and simply remove them, okay, in this particular case, and share them. And then the third thing, of course, is compile it down to the precision of, of, um, of, uh, of the target GPU. Now, this is, an ex this is the inferencing performance. Let me show you. Broadwell, this is the fastest CPU uh, of today. Skylake is the next generation CPU. We haven't had a chance to benchmark it yet, and so we're giving it the credit, the full credit of what's possible. K80 is the GPU that we announced five years ago, okay? And the, 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 the y-axis is images per second, how quickly it can do inferences in one second. Now, P100 is able to do 600 images per second. There are two important numbers. Not only is the throughput important, but the latency, how long it took you to do it, not how many you can do, but how long it took you to do it. The latency is equally important, and the reason for that is because if you were talking to a neural net, if you were talking to Cortana, and you asked Cortana the question, you would like it to respond very quickly in just a few milliseconds, in just a few milliseconds. And so the number of people who could speak to Cortana at the same time in the cloud is important because that has something to do with the capacity of the data center and the cost of the data center. The second thing is the latency of that performance is equally important, if not more important, and the reason for that is because that has something to do with the quality of service, okay? And so the purple line is latency, the green line is throughput. So P100 
has the benefit of 600 images per second, and Skylake is about 300, the next generation Skylake, and both of them could do it in about 10 milliseconds. This is what Volta looks like. That is what we call a little bit faster. <laughs> and so Volta is really groundbreaking work. Not only is Volta incredibly good at training, it is also incredibly good at inferencing for the very first time. We've not focused on inferencing in the past. And the reason for that is because the number of, pub, the number of networks that are being created was still ra rather limited. But now, internet server service providers and cloud service providers and startup companies and enterprises all over the world are starting to move deep learning into production. They need an inferencing pipeline. And so Volta, TensorRT, ideal for inferencing. The way that we deploy it into a server is also unique. And the reason for that is because the scale-out servers, gosh. Sandy, why do you keep standing over there? <laughs> why do I keep going over there? <laughs> Sandy, uh, stage manager, she's fantastic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tesla for hyperscale scale out. Look how small it is. Look at this thing. It's like a CD case but more beautiful, and it's gold. It might actually be real gold, okay? So Tesla V100, and th this is what we call the PCI Express FHHL, the sexiest name ever. Full height, half length. <laughs> Who does that? I couldn't rename it, it was too late. The industry took it and ran with it. Full height, half length. Try to say that without chapstick. Okay, so this is, a, and not only that, it runs at 150 watts. 150 watts, 150 watts. And it fits into these commodity inferencing servers. And here's the, thank you, Sam. This is the, this is the case I wanna make. This is the reason why people are talking about accelerators for data centers. I like to make the case for accelerators. Here's how it works. And so this is what, this is what 500 nodes look like. Earlier I said 400 nodes. This is what 500 nodes looks like. 500 nodes is basically this entire row of servers. Okay, it's an entire row of servers, 500 nodes. Well basically this 500 nodes can support 300,000 inferences per second. 300,000 seven millisecond inferences per second, which means if 300,000 people were connected into this data center and did a query or okay something or look for something and those inference networks were activated, we could support 300,000 people in this rack. 300,000 inferences basically translates to about 1,000 CPUs because as you saw earlier, the state-of-the-art CPU, the one that hasn't been announced yet is 300,000, 300 inferences per second. And so 1,000 CPUs basically translates into two nodes because each one of those little nodes, long nodes, has two CPUs inside. If we added all of that together at, at $3,000 per node, and remember, you have to buy the node, there's the interconnect, okay, and then there's um, all of the power that goes along with it. Power and cooling represents about 40% of a data center. But let's, let's ignore all of that for a second. And so 500, 500 nodes translates to basically a million and a half dollars, not to include all the cables and all the, the, the power delivery and the, and the cooling, et cetera. And it consumes 500, 500 watts each, so 250,000 watts, 250 kilowatts. Well, if Tesla, if we used a, a relatively conservative number of about 15x reduction, that basically translates to 33 nodes of this. That translates to 33 nodes. That's the savings. Instead of 500 nodes that occupies an entire row, you can replace it with 33 nodes, or you could increase the throughput of your data center by 15 times and not have to build more data centers as AI workloads floods into hyperscale data centers. 
this is one of the most important reasons why people ask us about, about FPGAs and accelerators and so on and so forth, and we decided why not make Volta the best inferencing machine that can possibly be made. And as a result, the, res the results are uh, incredible amounts of savings. Okay, so Tesla Volta for inferencing. Let me show you one more thing that's really super important. We've been working on all of these stacks, and the stacks are so complicated. You got a whole bunch of GPUs, a whole bunch of drivers, a whole bunch of systems, a whole bunch of middleware, all these different numerics, all these different frameworks, and there's so many frameworks, there's so many GPUs, there's so many versions of software, the ability for the industry to maintain all of this complicated stack of software, arguably the most complex stack of software the world's see, ever seen, is really, really, really difficult. And in fact, when you read the forums, it is such a pain. And for many deep learning engineers, it takes anywhere from a solid day to a couple of weeks to sometimes never achieving building a computer that can do deep learning. And so what we decided to do was to take this incredibly complicated stack and containerized it. We containerized it, and we dedicated ourselves to containerize every single framework and every single version of software that we know. And then once we containerize it, we're going to create a cloud registry for it. Okay? We're going to create a cloud registry for it. We're going to take all these containers, we're going to create a cloud registry for it, and here's, the, here's how it works. So whenever you're ready and you would like, you have a Titan X, and you're one of the several hundred thousand deep learning engineers in the world that has Titan Xs, and you're, you bought a Titan X, you don't want to build your own deep learning machine, you simply go to a website, type in your email address, register for this, you download the container of your choice. You download the container of your choice. That entire stack of software is fully optimized. It's fully integrated. It's containerized. It's virtualized. We download that into your machine. You start doing deep learning basically in a few minutes. There's no configuration, there's no building, there's no worrying about different versions. It's configured basically in just a few minutes. Use this a container called the MV Docker, and we create a registry for it. We support every single, every single framework. Then the next thing is once you start using, you used to use the platform, you start to realize that, gosh, I sure would love to have a lot more performance, and nothing would give me more joy than to tap into the 10,000 GPUs that are in the cloud. With just a click, you create an inst instance up there, we download the container up there, and we burst your workload into the cloud. Okay? So this is really the first hybrid deep learning cloud computing platform. And what we provide is just a registry. We provide the registry, the cloud computing platforms provide all of the cloud computing infrastructure, and we maintain the software, optimize the software for as long as we shall live. Let's take a look at it. Phil. Yes, yeah, so the, the NVIDIA GPU cloud provides multiple interfaces for developers and users to run deep learning. Uh, I'm going to focus today on the web application running in a browser. So we log in. And this is where you create your deep learning job. And there's just three steps. First, we select where we're going to run our, our deep learning workload. We call this the accelerated computing environment. Uh, you can pick from cloud, or your own DGX1 cluster, or a DGX station, or a, a Titan PC. Uh, today, we're going to focus on cloud. Uh, and you can see the options you have here. Uh, include the Microsoft Azure, uh, Amazon AWS, uh, and the NVIDIA Saturn V. This is the DGX supercomputer we built for internal development. Uh, I'm going to select uh, an 8-GPU node because I'm going to run a, a fairly heavy ResNet uh, training session. In the second step, you attach a data set or multiple data sets uh, to your job. Uh, here, I'm uh, and you get a choice between the existing data sets that you've already uploaded, uh, or you can create and upload uh, a new data set. I'm going to go with the ImageNet data set, uh, and this particular data set has both training and validation samples in it, 
So I only need one data set for this run. Next, we select the framework in a container, as Jensen was just describing. All of the different frameworks are provided, fully optimized, uh, and optimized for scale out to multi GPU. So ideal for our eight GPU run here. Uh, I'm going to take PyTorch um, and I'm going to take the latest release. You notice the numbered releases. We optimize, update uh, each of these frameworks every month. So at this point, my job spec is complete. I'm ready to go. But I want to notice that. We echo out the command line that's equivalent to uh, this web application run so that a developer can copy and paste this into a script and run it from one of our other interfaces, such as our command line interface. So now I start the job, and that takes us to the dashboard. This is the control center for the NVIDIA GPU cloud. covers all of the accelerated computing environments uh, that you've been running in. Uh, and you see the job at the top is the one we just created, the, uh, the ImageNet 256. Uh, it's already running. Uh, and you can click on any job to look at telemetry. Uh, there's a job here on four GPUs uh, I started a little while ago. Uh, it's also ResNet on PyTorch. Uh, and you can see we're keeping these GPUs running uh, flat out uh, as we run this uh, training session. That's great. Thank you. Good job, Phil. And that's it. That's the GPU. That's the GPU cloud, the NVIDIA GPU cloud. And it's a containerized system. It's a registry in the cloud, supports every single framework. And the thing that we will do is we will support these frameworks and every single one of the versions and every single one of the permutations of them on every single one of our GPUs for as long as we shall live. And that's something we do for accelerated computing for each one of the markets that we serve. It's going to be available beta in July. The NVIDIA GPU cloud platform. OK? <laughs> for all of you who are, who are anxious to burst into the cloud, this is the way to do it. All right, so let me summarize quickly on accelerated computing. If you take a look at some of the results that I've shown you, it is very, very clear that as Moore's Law comes to an end, that accelerated computing is really a wonderful path forward. And it's, it's a wonderful path forward because of the architecture, because of the system software stack, and because of the domains that we've selected, and the fact that we work across each one of the application's middleware and the architecture in an iterative basis. And over time, you can see that the results continue to compound. On the left is Amber Performance and Molecular Dynamics. On the right is Google Net Deep Learning. In both of those examples, we continue to advance. I want to now talk about AI at the edge. There's, I've got some delightful things I want to share with you. I'm going to go quickly. You guys know that we're really dedicated to the automotive industry. And the reason for that is we believe that everything that's going to move, in, move someday will be augmented by autonomy. Everything that's going to move someday is going to be augmented by autonomy. We're, we're enjoying, as you know, the Amazon effect. As we, every single day, buy things, don't forget, we used to drive to the store to pick up things, but now we expect the things to come to us. The number of truck drivers, the number of transportation professionals can't keep up with the Amazon effect. And so we have to find a way to automate as much of that entire path as possible. Augment it, take pressure off of the drivers. The number of truck drivers, for example, in many countries is short by about 50%. And so we need to find a way to automate some of this so that we can bring, bring, uh, keep up with the, the Amazon effect. Not to mention, we just, society could be much, much more beautiful and our environments could be much more beautiful if we didn't have any, so many parked cars. Very few of us would remember that for every car that we own, there's actually three parking spaces created for us, not to, in not to, in not to include, not even including the one we already own. And so there are 800 million parking spots in America. There's only 250 million cars. And it makes a lot of sense because we just never know when we need it. Okay, so, so I think autonomy vehicles, transportation, will be augmented by autonomy in the near future. We've created a platform we call the NVIDIA Drive. And basically, it's a roadmap. It's an architecture that spans level 2 to level 5 from augmented driving all the way up to completely driverless systems. We created a full stack 
we dedicated ourselves to go solve the self-driving car problem and create the software stack, but open up the software stack. To create the software stack, understand the problem deeply, but to open it up. And keep it open so that hundreds of people can use it. We now have 200 developers around the world using DrivePX. They're startups, they're shell companies, they're car companies, they're trucking companies. We have wonderful partners in Bosch, the, the largest tier one in the world, ZF, the largest trucking tier one in the world, Packar Trucking Company, all the startup companies that I mentioned earlier today. It's all possible because the Drive platform is open. And it's open on so many different levels, you can intercept it at any level that you desire. Let me show you a couple of videos of what it can do, and then I got a big announcement I'd like to share with you. And so the first thing is this. The first thing I'm gonna show you is mapping to driving. Basically how the car figures out where it is in the world and localize within it and detect um, everything that's around it and drive. The second thing that I wanna show you is how we use AI not just for driving, but also to be essentially a virtual co-pilot. And third, this is, this is, this is a phrase that Gil Pratt at Toyota created that I really, really love, and it's called a guardian angel. Even when you're not driving, even when the car is not driving for you, excuse me, even when the car is not driving for you, it should be watching out for you. And so the AI is on all the time, even if it's not in autonomous vehicle mode, it should be watching out for you. So let me show you a couple of videos. The first one is mapping the driving. And so in this particular case, the first thing that's happening is we're using the LiDAR. We have a LiDAR mapping car, and we're trying to detect everything that's around us, whether it's the lanes, the vertical poles. We're trying to create, essentially, an HD map of the structures in the world that we ought to use to localize ourselves later. Okay, so we detect all the road features. We construct the HD map. There are amazing companies who are doing this. We create the middleware, and uh, uh, there's a great company called DeepMap uh, who does this, and of course TomTom does this, here does this. Mapping company, we're partnering with mapping companies all over the world, and now we put that into our car, and it's in autopilot mode. Notice it's detecting the cars around it, it's detecting the lanes detecting all the signs, and now you have confidence that the BB-8 is driving safely in the road, okay? And the next one is Copilot. This is our own Janine. I can now drive you to work based on mapping previous drives. Shall I engage Autopilot? Oh, sure. Autopilot engaged, driving to work. Janine is, is uh, uh, in our mar marketing department, and she's also one of our test drivers. She's very, very brave. And so, beautiful and brave. All right, so, so uh, she has the benefit of a co-pilot there, and, and so, uh, she has the benefit of a co-pilot there, and, and basically what's happening is this. Of course, we, we're not gonna have the whole world mapped. And we're gonna map the world as fast as we can, and wherever um, it is mapped, the car should know. And it just lets her know that, hey, gosh, I could, I could drive the car for you now. Would you like me to take over? And the next, let me show you Guardian Angel. There we go. Green light. Time to go. Whoop. Cross okay. traffic danger. Maybe not. All clear. Disaster averted. Okay? And so, so this is possible because the car sees everything around it all the time. Well, uh, we have partners, as I mentioned, 200 partners around the world. They're startups, they're shuttle companies, they're, um, they're even um, uh, Airbus uh, creating, creating a self-flying self plane uh, that they would like to uh, make available in the year 2020. It's a VTOL, it takes off by itself. It occupies the space of two parking lots and it's for two passengers, and it'll go 70 miles. I can't wait for this. This is incredible. And, and so Airbus is creating a, an autonomous airplane. Uh, they're, they're a Dutch company using, our, using our, our platform for autonomous ships. They're companies who are using our platform for autonomous pizza delivery. And so keeping this open, creating an open platform, AI computer that everybody can use has proven to be incredible. Well, today I'm, I'm just incredibly honored to announce that Toyota has selected NVIDIA Drive PX for their autonomous vehicles. As you know, 
As you know, um, Toyota is the, one of the largest companies in the world. I believe they're the ninth largest company in the world. Uh, they have 350,000 employees. This is a company that is legend, legend in so many different ways. Uh, so much of modern management has come from Toyota. Kaizen, continuous improvement. Genji Genbutsu. I bet you guys didn't know about that one. Go to the source. See it yourself before you come up with a solution. Just-in-time manufacturing. The pull model of manufacturing, not push. So many of modern management systems were invented by this company. It's an incredible company. They dedicate themselves to the highest level of safety. So they're working with us, and the two engineering teams are now working incredibly hard together to create their autonomous vehicle car. And we'd like to finish it and put it on the road in the next few years. We would also have, an, have a mutual goal, a, a combined goal of having, achieving zero fatality someday. And so this is going to be the architecture for their future production cars. I'm super excited about that. Ladies and gentlemen, Toyota on DrivePX. The processor inside this Toyota machine will be the Xavier. Some of the things that's really cool about this is this. A lot of people are surprised. How is it possible you guys could put 30 trillion deep learning operations in 30 watts? Well, the reason for that is this. And this is a question that's come up a lot recently about accelerators and TPUs and FPGAs. Basically, the way you think about these processors, the CPU and the FPGAs are general purpose. They could almost do anything. You can make a CPU, write, you can write any software for it. You could use an FPGA to, to do any video decoder, Ethernet chip. You could make it do almost anything. The flexibility of these two architectures comes with it the cost of, it, of efficiency, the cost of efficiency. The next three processors, two CUDA GPUs, one is Pascal, one is Volta, and then the last one, the, the one on the bottom, is called a DLA, the DLA, Deep Learning Accelerator, what some people would call, for example, a TPU. They are specialized in their domains, and so therefore, they tend to be much more energy efficient, they much, much more performant within any constraint, within any constraint. I've already talked about how CUDA has been improved with the Tensor Core, and so Pascal's level of deep learning capability, although great, is now enhanced by Volta. You could take that even further. You could create a custom ASIC with what we call the DLA, and you can improve the energy efficiency by another third. Okay, you can improve it by another third. And so this basically gives you a landscape of all the different processors in the world. For our data center products, we need it to be flexible. We need to, we need to be able to run almost any network that comes our way. And so the flexibility of CUDA is too valuable for general purpose computing platforms, for data center platforms. However, in the case of Xavier, we've done something very special. What we've done is we've created a processor out of these three. In order to drive, you still need to localize, you need to reason about where you're going, you need to plan, and the planning process is highly parallel and requires 32-bit floating point processing. And so we decided that we would use CUDA for that. We also know that there's all kinds of interesting networks that we are about to deploy, not just computer vision object detection networks, but much more sophisticated networks for the future, and we need programmability for that. And so Xavier includes the CPU's single th threaded performance capability, CUDA's flexible parallel acceleration capability, and it also includes a deep learning accelerator that provides for specialized functions in computer vision. Well, the thing that's really, that's really great about this is now we have an architecture that is both programmable, super energy efficient, robust for all kinds of networks that we can come our way, can run the entire software stack of self-driving cars. And as we were thinking about building this, as we were building this, we realized that there are so many companies in the world who would value having the ability to create a deep learning accelerator. We understand this space so well because we understand the entire pipeline. 
we understand the entire pipeline from the beginning of the creation of the, the network all the way to deploying it into, the, into any environment. We understand and we have the software stack across the board. And so what we decided to do was realize that, gosh, it's so incredibly hard to put all this stuff together. Why don't we accelerate the adoption, democratize deep learning, lower the barrier of entry for every single of the trillion devices in the world that someday that will use deep learning. We're not gonna build them all. We're not gonna build them all. However, we would like to see adoption to accelerate for all of them. And so ladies and gentlemen, today, we're gonna open source the Xavier DLA. The best engineers in the world are working on the deep learning accelerator. We're gonna take this accelerator, what some people call TPU, and we're gonna open source it. And you can continue to follow our instruction set, or you could decide to change it. If you uh, adopt ours, uh, we'll continue to support it with software. If you decide to change it, um, it, it's no big deal either. Okay, it's completely open source. We're gonna early access it in July, and we'll have general access in September. Our goal is proliferated. Robots. Robots is the ultimate version of artificial intelligence. The robot is interesting, and it's going to revolutionize a whole slew of new industries, from manufacturing to healthcare. We know that robotic surgery is now able to perform surgeries that we simply can't imagine. However, don't forget that in the future, we're gonna have cybernetics. We're gonna have robots that are connected to parts of our body. We're gonna have little tiny robots that take care of various tasks. Robots, unfortunately, are incredibly hard to do, and the reason for that is because it has to sense the world, which we know how to do now. It has to learn from it and plan and take action, but it has to interact with the world. In the case of a self-driving car, our fundamental goal is collision avoidance. That is a specific objective. In the case of a robot, collision detection is essential. Your goal is to connect, your goal is to collide. How you collide is incredibly difficult to do. There's so many degrees of freedom in all of the joints and fingers and elbows and wrists and torsos of, your, of, your, of, a, of a kinetic object that training it is incredibly difficult. And so recently, some breakthroughs have happened. This is, uh, this is Ada at, um, at the Berkeley, Berkeley AI Laboratory, and they've taught Ada how to how to play hockey. And that's a, that right there um, is probably one of the world's finest AI researchers, and that's, that's what he does for a living. <laughs> and that's Ada learning, learning repeatedly, using reinforcement learning, how to, play, how to play hockey. Now, it turns out that hockey is not too bad. First of all, uh, convincing people to do that for all of your robots as you train it is probably difficult to do. However, remember, that's just hockey. What if we wanted to lift a car? What if we wanted to open a door? What if we wanted to cooperate with a doctor to do surger surgery? There is no way to have it learned this way, repeatedly in the physical world. And so the answer is this. It turns out we need to create an alternative universe. We need to create an alternate universe. This alternate universe has to obey the laws of physics in the sense that, that there's collision detection. It, it, it obeys the laws of physics and gravity if you choose, if you choose. It has to be visually photorealistic. It has to look like the world, or these robots can't learn within it. It has to look like the world, it has to sound like the world, it has to behave like the world, and it has to have the ability to learn inside this alternative universe. We have to be inside it as well, so that we could teach it using imitation learning, using all kinds of new deep learning techniques. So it has to be a virtual environment that we could be part of as well. This alternative universe that is visually real, that is physically real, has to have one additional characteristic. It should not follow the laws of time. The only thing that we expected to do is to be hyperspaced. We would need it to train in warp speed. And the reason for that is because we, there's no reason for us to have to wait around for Ida to 
learn how to play hockey in the physical world in real time. And so we created a new tool. It's a new world. It's a new simulator we call Isaac. Isaac is named after the two Isaacs. Isaac Newton for physics and Isaac Asimov of AI. We brought the two Isaacs together into this new world we call Isaac. Isaac has the input of environments and robots. So we can put virtual sensors of the robot. We can vir- we put, put the virtual actuators and the virtual effectors of the robot into it. And it's connected to OpenAI's OpenAI gym, where all the reinforcement learnings and all the interesting algorithms that could be applied. We would simulate in this environment and run it on top of any NVIDIA GPUs. And inside that computer is a virtual brain. And when we're done with it, we literally take that virtual brain and put it into a real robot. And this robot wakes up almost as if it was born to know this world. And then the last little bit of domain adaptation that it does is done in the physical world. And so when a robot uh, turns on, it has already been pre-trained, if you will, and it would be pre-trained in, in the Isaac world. And we, as a company, have the unique capability to bring this capability together. We know how to do physics in super real time. We know how to do amazing computer graphics. We know how to do AI. And so we decided to integrate it all into one thing we call Isaac. So ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at it. And so notice, when Mike moves the puck, when it moves the net, Isaac somehow figures it out. Oh! Now this all looks wonderful. <laughs> okay, this is all in, in computer graphics. Now one of the things that we could do is, of course, we could repeat, we could replicate a whole bunch of Isaacs and have them all learn. And then we take the smartest one. And we take the brain out of that smartest one and we put it in everybody else's brain and then we say, okay, now start again. And then we figure out which one's the smartest one. And we take that brain, we put it into everybody else's and we say, start again. And so as a result, we could accelerate the time to learning. Look at all these Isaacs, they're all trying to figure it out. They're all trying to figure it out. And so that's great. Let's, um, let's, let's take a look at some of, their, some of the clips from when they were learning. It's got to figure out where the puck is. It's got to using. It's got to see the puck, figure it out. It's got to figure out how hard to hit it. It's got to figure out where to hit it. That's incredible. Now, guys, ladies and gentlemen, Isaac. Well, look, if it can learn how to play, if it can learn how to play hockey, it can surely learn how to play golf. And so here's Isaac learning how to putt. And so, so uh, let's, let's do it. There's Isaac. Reads the green. Reads the green. Nice. Now, remember this. No programming was done. No programming was done. Isaac just sat there and tried and tried and tried and tried until it figured out how to putt. Okay, not strong enough. Well, let's let's get, really? Oh, no way. All right, let's give, oh, I was going to say, let's give Isaac something hard to do. Let's move, oh, here it comes. All right. Okay, good job. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Isaac. So the next time, next time, next time you guys see Isaac, 
Uh, I hope that Isaac is standing in the middle of a, of a sand bunker, and we'll teach it how to chip out and uh, see if we can sink it. Okay, so Isaac, this is a robotic simulator, the next stage of AI, where you have to sense the world, figure out what you learn from the world, and plan about what you're going to do, act, take action, sense the results of your action, and you go around in that loop. And we create a simulator that makes it possible for robots to learn inside this, inside this, uh, inside this virtual world, this alternative re universe. And hopefully, as we put this out there, there'll be all kinds of robots that are going to be created, and they'll, they'll use uh, reinforcement learning and transfer learning and other, imitation learning and other forms of learning um, in order to, to program these very sophisticated robots. That's it. That was what we talked about today. We talked about two things. We talked about the fact that accelerated computing is really coming to the fore. This is the rise of accelerated computing. Our GPU computing platform has been adopted, adopted by high-performance computing scientists all over the world. And recently, with the advent of deep learning and the breakthroughs there, we're now seeing a new era in computing we call the era of AI. Volta is the next generation, next giant leap into that new world. We also introduced several things with Volta. One is a brand new instruction set we call the Tensor Core. Second, a full compiler and optimizer for inferencing we call Tensor RT. Between Tensor Core and Tensor RT, not only do we accelerate deep learning, but we also make it possible for hyperscale data centers to deploy deep learning broadly into their data centers without having to build more and more and more data centers. We can save 15 times the cost of deploying deep learning into the world. We introduced uh, DGX1 and DGX1 Station. Both of them are open for orders now. We also have the support of every single cloud computing partner in the world. And so you can find the NVIDIA GPUs with all of our software on Alibaba and Amazon and Baidu and Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Tencent. Every single cloud will have this one standard architecture. One of the things that we've done is introduce this idea of a containerized software stack that allows you to use one software stack without having to optimize your computer from premise to cloud. And this way, when you're ready to burst into the cloud, that software stack is already in the cloud registry. It's all fully optimized, and you don't have to reconfigure it. We also announced that we would like to expand the reach of deep learning to proliferate this capability, to democratize the, the, the ability for every single IoT device around the planet, the trillions of them that are going to be able to use deep learning in the future, to be able to access a world-class design. We're going, to ex, we're going to open source the Xavier DLA design. We're going to continue to advance it, continue to improve it, and we'll, um, people who use it will continue to gain the benefits of it. We also announced two, new, two other things. Toyota has now announced their support and creation of their future autonomous vehicles based on the NVIDIA Drive PX platform. And then lastly, we announced the first ultimate re alternate reality virtual robot simulator so that we can hopefully work together to bring the future of artificial intelligence and robotics to the world. That's all I have today. Thank you guys very much for coming. Have a great GTC. It's great seeing all of you.